What's up, buddy? Here we are. This is it. It worked on the first try. There's got to be something that's going to be terribly wrong really, really you, soon. You, you're, you're one of your sons must have set this up for you. It was to actually, they're not even here, and I was able to turn the lights on, so we're good. It's amazing. Um, we are going to uh, give it a few minutes, guys. So we're going to be talking about power development. Uh, we wanted to hop on early just to make sure we didn't have any uh, technical difficulties, not to say that we may not have any in a few minutes, but uh, we're going to talk about power development, and uh, we want you guys to ask as many questions as possible. We want this to be sort of interactive. Uh, Jake Fish, appreciate you, man. I wouldn't say I'm an ins inspiration, but I'll take it. Um, but uh, yeah, so guys, we're going to be talking about exercise selection. We're going to be talking about how you can implement uh, plyometrics into your training programs, how to scale basic prerequisites, et cetera. So we are going to give you some hands-on in the trenches advice on how to look at power development. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they make these grandiose programs and they look super fancy, but in real life, it never happens. So we're going to give you some insight on how to develop power for high school athletes, collegiate. We both worked with professional athletes. Um, as you can see in the background of Eric, he's got his, uh, his, his jerseys in the back from the Giants. We won't talk about that lucky yeah, game. But it is, you know, what you know is. what they say, Mike, once is lucky, twice is good. Yeah, it is what it is. I mean, I'm not bitter. You know, my therapist says I'm working through it. So at this point, I think we're uh, we're pretty good. So, well, just just to, to also clear the record that I no longer have anything to do with the current state of, of affairs, which is happening in, in, in the Meadowlands right now. They haven't had a winning record since I haven't been there. It has nothing to do with me, but at least I can have that tagline, Mike. But you should actually you should say it has everything to do with you actually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that is the one hundred percent reason. Put it on the back of the New York Post. Exactly. So, um, so anyways, yeah, guys, uh, we got about a minute or so here. Um, and again, we want you guys to ask questions. Uh, you know, feel free to pop some questions into the comments. We're going to do our best to answer those questions to the best of our ability. Uh, and, and here's the thing. This is not like pre-recorded. We didn't hop on a call and be like, hey, let's make sure we have the same answers. Um, we've worked together in, in various uh, projects and we're, we're working on this um, course called Principles of Program Design, but we also both uh, teach and lecture for FMS, perform better, et cetera. So um, we work together. But the cool thing about this is it's going to be interactive because I don't know everything that he does and, and vice versa. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking um, from, from real life experience and I'm going to be learning from Eric and Eric is going to be uh, learning from us. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get rolling here. So let's talk about power development um, and Let's first talk about exercise selection, and we'll kind of go back and forth on this. Um, how do you decide what exercises are appropriate for power development? Is there, is there a checklist? Is there some main principles that you use? Is it individual? So, so give me the rundown. Give me the quick sort of idea on how you choose what exercises. Okay, so probably the, the, the uh, point we need to make before that is the exercise doesn't dictate the outcome. Right. We could do squats for heavy singles, doubles and triples, um, which could get us really strong. Um, we could do squats for sets of sets of 10 to 15 and, and, and build some muscle. We could do squats for sets of you know 50 and build endurance. And then none of that really discusses power. It's really power is where you start having a time element. Right. It's where the, I need to get this done right now. And there's that means there's intent involved. And there's a speed and rate of force production that needs to be considered. So really, almost anything could become, quote unquote, a power exercise. Obviously, there's ones that are more suited towards it. Um, but that's the first thing we have to kind of frame this with is the exercise doesn't necessarily dictate the result. And we talk a bunch about that in the course. But um, in terms of how we position and, and, and kind of choose exercises, and I'm curious how, how you kind of break it out is, is obviously we have to look at where do they need the power. And there's a post that I put up today talking about how I uh, actually use both the FCS from, from uh, functional movement, um, the fundamental capacity screen, as well as the TPI power screen to say, where do I even need the power? Do I need it from the upper body? Do I need it from the lower body? Do I need it from the core? Do I need it in rotation? Do I need it in one direction more than the other? And then obviously you have to consider 
what's the demands of the individual, you know, and what they're going to go into. So you're going to have a bias because, because Mike, obviously, if you don't know, works with a ton of fight, ton of fighters and works with guys in, in the MMA and UFC. Whereas I work with a lot more field sports. I work with a lot of football, baseball players. It's a little bit different in terms of uh, what the end product has to look like. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we need to really understand about sort of exercise selection is, um, Again, you mentioned sort of sets and reps, but certain exercises are a little bit more biased towards what we would call power development, right? So if someone is performing a hang clean or a power clean, they're not doing that for hypertrophy. Hopefully they're not doing that for a conditioning effect. Um, but if you're, if you're programming a hang clean or a power clean or a snatch, probably it's gonna be because you're trying to get someone more powerful. Same thing with, um, you know, kettlebell swings. Kettlebell swings are great for power, but you can use them for endurance as well. So again, certain exercises are suited, but at the same time, uh, certain exercises aren't going to be the most advantageous when it comes to, uh, when it comes to choosing exercises. So I'm going to, I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to talk about how I program, uh, my basic exercises for power development. Now, this is obviously going to depend on the athlete. So if it's, if it's an athlete looking to improve their overall performance, I'm going to have sort of two buckets. I'm going to have true power development, and then I'm going to have um, the idea of deceleration and landing mechanics. And then we're going to dig a little bit deeper on this as well. So let's take a box jump. So a box jump is a bilateral exercise that is often programmed to focus on lower body power development. And because of the fact that it is an elevated landing, it's a little bit easier to stick that landing. So the question is, is are we using a box jump truly for power development or are we using it for, um, for landing mechanics and deceleration? And the answer is, it depends. You show me an athlete that already moves well, that already knows how to hinge, and that has a base level of strength, I'm probably gonna be using that box jump for a little bit more of power development. If it's for an athlete that is maybe not super strong and maybe they need to spend a little bit more time on um, deceleration, change of direction, et cetera, I may be using a box jump to focus on landing mechanics. But the box jump is gonna look pretty similar, but at the same time, how I program it and how I cue it is gonna be very, very different. And that's gonna go for all of the lower body patterns. So let's say I've got my bilateral stance, which is you know a, a box jump, kettlebell swing, you could add the Olympic lifts in there as well. Then you've got your split stance, uh, which is going to be biased towards a lunge pattern. It could be a drop lunge, a plyo lunge, et cetera. And then you've got your single leg. And that's sort of my three lower body buckets that I program my power development with. But at the same time, I, if you see me uh, doing a single leg hop, am I doing this for power or am I doing it for landing? And the answer is it depends on the athlete or maybe it's for both, right? Because there are benefits for everything. So um, just saying that you're strictly going to use one exercise for one thing um, can be a, a little bit confusing because it's all about the application and the context. So how do you, Eric, when you're talking about, let's say, lower body power development, what do you look into? Like, what are you looking for? What is your thought process when it comes to lower body power development? So when you mentioned before is a checklist, is I have kind of a checklist that I go through and that we look at first is your foot stances, right? We work out of three primary foot stances. We're either single leg, we're split stance, or we're open stance. And I'll, I'll weight one, you know, more of our work towards whatever foot stance you're going to spend the most time in, right? Uh, whereas an offensive lineman spends a lot more time in an open stance versus um, a baseball pitcher is a lot more single leg and, and split stance. Um, so that's first is your foot position because we have one of three foot positions. I, if, you, if you'll notice a theme and you notice in the course, I use everything in threes. And so... Um, the second thing I look at is, is the kind of that continuum you talked about is that we're either producing force or accelerating, um, we're um, reducing force, we're decelerating, or we're amortizing, we're kind of transitioning from one to the other, right? Um, and then so now the next thing we look at is, and this is a, a very um, overlooked thing, and I had a post on this earlier in the week and all these power posts that we've been doing, is plain. Is, move, is what direction you're moving in, right? Front to back, side to side, and rotation. And if we don't, especially for me with a field sport athlete, if we don't respect all those planes and everything's front and back sagittal plane, we're going to miss out on a huge amount of things because not only for, for power. 
injuries happen in that transverse plane and to be able to, to manage those forces and, and how, to, how to kind of self-organize and reproduce is going to be pretty critical. So um, those, those, that's kind of the, the, the checklist I look at there. And then it's just a, you know, then it's just a matter of picking whatever exercises we can go through a laundry list that goes all day. But a point that, that you brought up and I brought up is the deceleration is that, you know, I explained it last night to some new athletes and said, all right, we got to build gas, right? We all want to go move faster, but you also got to build brakes. Which one are you going to pick first? And if you're smart, you're going to pick the brakes. If not, you're just going to crash into stuff, right? So we need to have your, 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 your gas is only as good as your brakes. And uh, if you listen to what, what Dr. Greg Rose, who works with us at FMS, as well as with me at on base, um, talks a lot about what's called the big break theory and that there's actually uh, that the theory that the better you can decelerate, the more it's going to allow you to accelerate. And even certain things when we look at like rotation, we do as part of the TPI power test, we do a, a shot put rotational throw. And I'm looking for uh, as minimal a difference between your left and right sides as possible because everything that makes you rotate to your left is the brakes for what makes you rotate right. Yeah. And, and you know what you said? Uh, you said something that um, kind of got me thinking. You were talking about obviously moving in various planes and uh, accelerating and deceleration. And, and I would argue that uh, the best athletes in the world and it's you know, we can talk about, you know, the Michael Jordans or whoever um, have the ability to be very, very quick and, and explosive when they need to be. But they can also be relaxed when they need to be. And it's this. Uh, this interplay of tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation. And the best athletes know how to do that very, very well. And they may not even know why they can do it well. They just can. Or maybe they haven't ever been in a situation where they could not. Um, and having the ability to be really quick and have control is, is really the name of the game. It's about change of direction with a lot of sports. And, and even change of direction is power, right? It's you're trying to get into a position and get out of a position. And when you go, you cut, you change direction and you propel yourself out of whether it's, um, you know, you're doing suicides, you're doing a line touch or just a, a basic lateral deceleration. There is uh, a deceleration component and an acceleration component. So I would argue that a lot of the power development exercises that people are programming can have the benefits of both. You can actually program acceleration and deceleration. My big thing that I've been doing uh, recently is um, when I'm programming box jumps, my thing is if you can jump to it, you should be able to drop off of it and stick that landing. So it's kind of like, hey, if I, cool, if you wanna jump to a 48 inch box, which again is not indicative of a 48 inch vertical leap, but if you're gonna jump really high, you better be able to drop down and stick that landing. So that's the whole idea of building the brakes is just as important as building uh, the gas pedal. And ever since I've been um, really doing that with my athletes, it's funny, they start to, they start to look at it a little bit differently. Like, oh, you want me to, you know, they all want to do the 40 inch box jump, but then when you get them standing up and they're looking down and it looks like they're on top of a fridge, they're going, oh man, this is a little bit, this is a little bit more intimidating. But at the same time, that's what they need. So I think it's also an ego check, which is nice. So again, you can build in ways to get both. And that's the beauty of, of um, you know, power development for a lower body standpoint. Now let's talk about power development for an upper body. Um, here's one thing that I always do. If, if you can't show me some general body weight exercises for your upper body, like if you can't do push-ups, um, I don't want to say pull-ups because pull-ups are a hard exercise, but if you don't have a base level of strength with your upper body, adding a bunch of upper body plyometrics are probably a waste of time. And I'm not saying that you can't do med ball throws and you can't do a bunch of uh, rotational work or med ball chest passes. But from my experience, what I've found, when you have weaker athletes, you have a really nice way to program those lower body patterns, the split stance, the bilateral, the single leg, because again, you get the deceleration component. But at the same time, what I'll do with my athletes is I'll actually program a, uh, and this is again, athletes that let's say aren't super strong yet. I will program lower body power with maybe some core. Maybe it's some anti-rotational core because they need the ability to uh, resist rotation. That's going to have a greater impact on their overall development than have them throw a medicine ball with this lackadaisical throw that just drives me absolutely crazy. 
So that's, that's one of the things that I've, I've really changed about upper body power development is if you don't have that base level of strength, I'm going to find ways to build the overall engine before I start to implement upper body power. And it's not to say that you can't do power exercises, but I found that by adding, you know, pairing those, those upper body power, I'm sorry, those lower body power exercises with core drills uh, or even some carries um, is a really nice way to, again, build the overall, uh, build the overall engine. So uh, one point going back to deceleration and the drops, which, which I love, is if you want another element, and this is a super ego check, what I've started implementing, I stole this from, from Greg Cook, is I went out and got a bunch of um, cornhole bean bags, right? And put them on the top of your head. And when you do your, your, your box jumps or your, your snap downs or something like that, have that there. Um, because if you don't do it well and you don't absorb the force as well, the thing's going to dump right off. And so that's a great regulator because head position is sitting on top of your spine and everything's going to stack underneath that. And that kind of leads into the next thing we were kind of talking about prerequisites is one of the things is, can you kind of get to the postures and positions and shapes that allow you to produce and reduce force? Well, right. We have, you know, not to get too deep into the weeds with, uh, you know, exercise, you know, science here, but you have the, the cross bridges of, of your muscle fibers that, they don't real work real well at a complete shortened position. They don't real work real well at a complete lengthened position. There's an ideal position where they produce and absorb the best force, and that's what our posture will help dictate. Now, when I say posture, I'm not talking about standing in front of a grid in an anatomical position. I'm talking about like posture in different athletic stances. And and what I call an athletic stance when I teach it is it's a position you could go anywhere at. It. It's you, if the fire alarm rang, you could run forward, back, side, diagonal and you're in a position to produce and absorb force. And so that kind of self-organization, the ability to get into those postures and positions and shapes is going to dictate the platform at which we're going to produce uh, power from. And so like I, I've done uh, some of Charles Poliquin's uh, internship and, and he has a famous line of, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe, right? So we need to have at least the ability to create the motor control stability and awareness of postures and positions before we even worry about layering on an explosive uh, expression of whatever we want to do, whether it's a, a medicine ball or it's a, a kettlebell or it's a, it's a jump. Yeah, absolutely. And the one thing that I've learned uh, over the last almost 20 years of just simply messing up is um, you know, when you spend the time teaching the, the younger athletes, the up and coming athletes, just the base, we all know the basics. There's freaking t-shirts and posters based off of him, but Whole, I mean, you can see that everywhere. And yes, there's obviously some some benefit to those patterns. But when you take the time to just get those athletes, let's just call it base level strong, whatever that is. Um, and then you start introducing acceleration and deceleration, etc. You're going to have a much better time um, working with a, a very weak athlete or an athlete that's never trained before. Uh, power development, starting with power development is not wise. And uh, you're going to you're going to be disappointed when you think you're going to try to get uh, the outcome that you're looking for. And, and listen, you can't be powerful if you're not strong. And it's as simple as that. At a certain point, you're going to have to decide as a coach um, when to introduce power development training. Um, and you're going to you're going to know rather quickly what the right exercises are. And that's one other thing I want to talk about from an exercise standpoint. So many people like I love cleans. Okay, cool. Awesome. You know, uh, barbell cleans. Awesome. Or I love snatches, barbell snatches. Awesome. I love kettlebell swings. Great. Guys, pick whatever you like. But I think the biggest mistake is people don't choose the exercises that they're really good at teaching and scaling. So if you're a 10 year old female athlete that's never lifted before, in my opinion, doing a hang clean with an empty bar that weighs 15 pounds, like a technique bar is probably not the best use of time. I'm not saying you can't do that, but maybe just get them a little bit stronger and uh, eventually you can introduce some low level plyos. But like for myself, I can teach a, a hang clean and a power clean. I'm not as good as some other people are. And even in the area, I know some people that are way better uh, at teaching Olympic lifting. I just don't teach it because I'm not that good at it, to be honest with you. I'm okay. 
but I'm really good at teaching plyos and kettlebell work. So I'm going to bias my exercise selection based off of my own skill because I don't want to step out of bounds. And, and I don't want to say get out of my scope of practice because this isn't like a fitness and medical talk. But listen, if I can't teach it well and I don't understand the nuances of progressions and regressions, I'm just not going to simply choose that exercise. Yeah, I, and there's there's a, a great post. I actually retweeted something from Mike Boyle this week is as far as talking about Olympic lifts and, and saying, you know, it, it, it really depends on your situation and your ability to coach it and your ability to have quality control with it. And, and with that, I have uh, consulting gigs with multiple high schools. And so I, I'm not going to argue with you on Twitter or the benefits of Olympic lifting, but I will argue with you that if I'm going to write a program that I'm not there for every lift. I'm not the, you know, old school high school strength coach that shows up with the newspaper and the coffee at three o'clock and I'm there every day. Um, I'm there as a consultant. So I put together a program to say for the football team. And then I'm there maybe once a week or every other week just to kind of make sure everything's going smooth and going right and answer questions and, and progress and regress. I can't trust that the offensive line coach who the last time he was in a weight room was in, when he was in high school that I'm going to have him coach and teach one of the most complex skills that you'll ever see in a weight room. It's so, I, I explain it this way. If you're good at it, they give you a medal, right? So that is a sport in of itself. It's not knocking Olympic lifting. It's just saying it doesn't scale for the situation that I have. So let's talk about quality control, right? So how do you keep quality control? Because power can be incredibly, incredibly, no pun intended, powerful in terms of improving someone's not only performance, but, but quality of life, but, but power also can get really ugly, really fast. And, you know, we don't have to work hard to find some, 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 uh, so, you know, internet fails of people really getting hurt doing, you know, something in the guise of power. So what are some of your, we always talk about in the course, guardrails and speed limits that you look at for, for when you're programming power? So when possible, you know, I'd love to be able to say that I have a Tendo unit on every barbell in the gym and I monitor everybody's uh, jumping ability and the landing ability, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that I do try to do is I, I don't try to over, over program things. And, and what I mean by that is um, if I'm working with an athlete uh, and we're going to be, say it's a three day a week program, I'm going to one lower body specific movement for that day. So maybe let's say it's a Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday program. I may have a bilateral a split stance and a, uh, a single leg day. So one of the things that, um, that I've noticed is that when you give people targets and what I mean by targets is what, whether it's a broad jump, for example, let's say someone does a broad jump and they can broad jump 10 feet. And we know that that is their base level right? They know that they can cork, they can load up and boom, hit a broad jump and it's 10 feet, which would be a pretty damn good broad jump, by the way. Um, what I want to do is every time they jump, I want to have some sort of metric to see if they're falling off or if they're actually repeating that explosive base movement. And it could be something as simple as just measuring, put a piece of tape here, you put a piece of tape here and are they clearing the tape when they're jumping? Okay. And, and that's a simple way to kind of do some low level sports science. Um, and if you want more uh, information on this, by the way, um, this sort of idea of, of monitoring, check out the book Intent uh, by Devin McConnell. And I apologize to the other author. I don't know who it is, Devin's a buddy of mine, but the book Intent will give you some very simple ways to build constraints and, and to get uh, more data off of individuals. But again, simple tapes, right? You can just say, all right, this is, we know that you're capable of doing this. And then we can kind of go from there. We could use a just jump mat. We have just jump mats. And, and every once in a while, I'm going to bring that out. And I'm just going to look and see what their power development looks like. Yes, I would love to have multiple force plates just set up. So anybody could come over and, and uh, do what they want. But uh, again, it's just finding repeatable metrics that are simple to use. And obviously, if you're with a professional team and you have uh, all of this high-end equipment like force plates and tendo units and um, accelerometers and push bands. Uh, if you have the ability to do all that, awesome. But that's also a that's another job, right? <laughs> data, data analysis, etc. So what I try to do to go back to your original question is just get simple, repeatable ways to give the athlete an understanding of, hey, what does this look like? Like lifting weights, we get feedback. Either you kind of lift it or you don't. 
Um, when it comes to power development, we're obviously looking at, um, you know, contact time on the ground, rate of force development, blah, 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 how quickly you can move. But the simplest way is to find, uh, find a way for each athlete that they know what they're supposed to do. And, and if they can't achieve that, one of two things have happened. One, maybe we're not resting long enough. Or two, maybe we've programmed, uh, we've programmed a, a bit too much volume, et cetera, because nine times out of 10, when it comes to power development, less is more. Um, what about you? Is, uh, what do you tend to use for that? Uh, you kind of hit on one of my top three. One of them is, is a simple, a simple rule, and it could be as low tech uh, as, like you said, as a tape measure. Uh, it could be as high tech as I, you know, using a VVT, like push band type of thing. But the first rule is meter beat it, right? Whatever your, we set as your baseline, if you're hitting a, a 1.0 in your, in your squat on a, on a push band, every rep's got a meter beat 1.0, right? That's our goal. Or if you're doing a, some type of broad jump or, or lateral jumps or something like that, you got a meter beat that. That's, that's kind of the, the, the first rule is, is, is make sure that we're not, and then the second thing kind of goes off of that is that, um, especially this works really well with sprint work, is that I have uh, what I call a 10% rule to, 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 to go a little more granular with it. Uh, the 10% rule is for the more beginner intermediate. And then I probably, I trim it down to five for more advanced or, or, you know, high level, higher level athlete. What I mean by that is you can cover you. It's, it's a matter of like distance covered or um, dis, you know, time, uh, time to cover a certain distance. And let's say we're just doing a, a, a 50 yard sprint and you can do that in five seconds for easy math, is that you're, you're going to rest enough. We'll get to that in a second, which you, you touched on is really important, is after we rest appropriately, that you got to get within 5%, or I'll give you a little more buffer room if you're more beginner, or 10% uh, of that last performance. And as soon as you don't, you're done. Go home. Okay. And so that's the last piece is that, and a really good, if you're just focusing on power, you got, you should go home somewhat fresh, um, that you can't get tired and get powerful at the same time. There's, there's a big difference between truly trying to develop power. Cause I want to hit a ball, throw a ball, hit someone, uh, or run fast or do something extremely powerful and explosively than a hit workout. They are two different worlds and we need plenty of time to, to recover in between because what we sometimes can't see is what kills us. And that, you can kind of feel the fatigue or the burn in your muscles when you're doing, um, you know, uh, you know, echo bike intervals or uh, if you're doing bicep curls. But one of the things that we, we don't appreciate and, and we underestimate is the taxing of the nervous system. OK, and so how much time that takes to recover. Um, and so, you know, two to five minute breaks is, is kind of the, the minimum that we need to really be able to express good power. Um, and, and to create speed. And so because of that, we got to make sure we have good long rest periods and we can't over-program the volume. So th those guardrails are that 10% rule, the meter beat it rule, um, they just kind of keep us in check. Um, and, then in, and then appreciating that also, the cumulative effect of your training is that if you do a, a, a ton of power work on Monday, that you can't come back and do it again Tuesday. Your nervous system is taxed from that. And so I have to appreciate that now. I have, a, I have a couple pro pitchers that I'm working with. They throw their bullpens on Tuesday. Mondays, I have to dial back their training because their, their bullpens are going to be useless on Monday, or on Tuesday, I should say, if we do a ton of power stuff on Monday. And so that the fatiguing of the nervous system and, and the appreciation of that, and, and I'll give you another resource here. If you're not uh, listening to Andrew Huberman's podcast, he's a neuroscientist at Stanford you're missing out because it is so much incredibly good information. He is very uh, elegant in how he puts it into, into understandable stuff. So even, you know, guys like me from Jersey can understand 75% of it. There you go. So uh, there's, there's actually a couple things I want to talk about. And, and we were talking about constraints and, and being able to replicate that performance. Um, when it comes to power development, yes, you absolutely want. To. And, but we also need to understand that, power development can come in very, very different forms. And yes, when we think power, we want max effort, right? But at a certain point, um, if you are trying to work with an athlete that needs to, um, to, needs the ability to demonstrate power in a repetitive fashion over time, it's a very, very different conversation because 
you're never going to get a 100% max effort scenario with a 30 to 40 second break and be able to repeat that performance. But you may be able to repeat that performance or 85% of it multiple times. So having a baseline of data, that's where you can start to get some great insight on if people are dropping off or not. Or not. So I'm gonna give you a perfect example of that. Um, when I do my conditioning assessments for my fighters, we have a couple different ones that we use, but I do a max effort power test and I just set it up um, and I use the Rogue Echo just because I'm familiar with those and those things are bulletproof. And I'll set it up and I'll actually set it up to target calories and I'll set three calories, which takes about 10 to 12 seconds. And I'll have someone just go as hard as they can for you know that amount of time, 10 to 12 seconds. You burn three calories really, really quick on those. And then boom, what it's going to give me is it's going to give me a reading of their max power output. So let's say that their max power output is 1,000 watts. We know that 100% of their max power is 1,000. So if we are gonna start programming maybe some sprint repeats uh, or some, you know, uh, explosive repeats with maybe some box jumps or not box jumps, um, maybe with some uh, elasticity work, et cetera. Now we have some viable metrics. I'm, hey, listen, when you do this five to seven second sprint on the bike, make sure that you're at least, you know, getting a minimum of 850 watts and that way they have a target. So you can actually use those metrics for uh, conditioning purposes, right? Because again, you can use a bike for you know, power development, or you can use the bike for steady state. Same thing with running and sprinting, right? If you want to get someone really, really fast, you can have them sprint, but you're going to need a lot of uh, recovery. So finding metrics on everything you do, in my opinion, is one of the, the missing links on power development and programming. So uh, the, the, the two things that I'm thinking about here is one is how much of a different the dynamics are. And I actually have to teach this when I'm working specifically with, with baseball players is that it's not Bugs Bunny where you get 10 pitches in a row where you have to swing, 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 swing. Anyway, the pitcher is going to do that. You, there's a, you know, throw it back to the pitcher. He does his thing and, and people complain about the, the, the pace of the game, but there's, there's a, there's a decent break between each power expression, right? So, um, it's very different than for I work with a football player. I, in the football players, you, you break it down and I, I show in my performance pyramid, one of the factors to consider in your programming is style of play. Am I working with the, with someone who does a traditional I formation wing T line up, you know, huddle up and then call a play and it's two yards in a cloud of dust, or is it a spread offense? That's no huddle. And they have, they get 10 seconds between plays, right? That's going to affect how you program that stuff. Um, so that's kind of – you have to think about the end environment that your person's going to end up in, I think, is, is important. Um, and, and your world's very different than my world in terms of how that gets programmed. Um, and then if we look at uh, some other factors that, that we can read that we sometimes don't think about is breathing, right? And um, do we do certain – there's – you know, we talk about in the course, a, a wheel of breathing, and there's nine different strategies we talk about, depending on what you want to create. Um, and do I need to be that pitcher who needs to catch the ball, settle themselves so they don't get over overhyped because there's tens of thousands of people in stands and it's the ninth inning and you need to get now? Or do I need to actually create some excitation because I need to ramp up my nervous system and you're, we can go to a whole thing of warm up to develop power before, you know, that as well. Um, so what type of breathing are you doing? And then what type of breathing you, is your strategy when you're expressing power and your breath has to kind of match your, your, your speed, your movement. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it other than, you know, throwing around a medicine ball and doing Olympic lifts and jumping on boxes. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, you know, another, to pay attention to is the athlete's posture as they start to perform multiple sets. What do they look like? And, uh, you know, a lot of the times, I forget who the first coach to say this was, is they called it the shit test. What does it look like? Well, if it looks good, it's probably good. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And the ability to maintain a quality posture as fatigue sets in is a skill in and itself. Um, and if you are doing true power work, you shouldn't be slouched over huffing and puffing, recovering because you're so gassed out. That's called conditioning. And I would even argue um, there are, I know that there's better ways and better postures and advantageous postures when it comes to recovery. But um, 
again, when it comes to power development, always look at their posture and what their what the shape of their body looks like, because I think that's something that people oftentimes miss. And you can start to see it when they start to get a little bit tired or maybe from a neurological standpoint, they're just smoked. Um, because guys, guess what? We need more rest than we think. And there aren't that many metrics that we can use other than just uh, obviously looking at the performance. It's not like you can use heart rate. If you're doing power work, heart rate is irrelevant. You do, you know, four broad jumps in a row, you're, you're you know, you're, your heart rate's going to jump a little bit. But if you are programming, let's say, hey, I want to do uh, broad jumps. And once I get back to a heart rate of, you know, 100 beats per minute, then we're going to redo it again. Well, guess what? You're just going to keep going and going and going because you're actually never going to drive your heart rate that high to begin with when you're doing power. It's just not going to jump that high. So I know we're getting up against it with time, and I saw one question that scrolled past that's actually more suited for uh, the, the talk that we're doing next week. We're going to get back on these guys doing these every Friday at 1 o'clock with different topics. And uh, the topic for next week is, is kind of an interesting one, especially coming from us, guys who have kind of been teaching what people think is corrective exercise. It's, it's the topic instead of power for programming, like, it, you know, pro, uh, programming for power like it is today. Next week is why we hate corrective exercise. Um, Cause someone asked a question about, well, what do you do if you have someone who's had a specific type of surgery and how does that affect their exercise? And the answer is the, the, the one of the answers in, in Mike, you mentioned 20 years and I, I've been going uh, a little bit longer than you. The answers that, I, that I've gotten way more comfortable with is I don't know, and it depends, right? Because you can have five people that all uh, had the same exact surgery and react very differently. What was their state going into it? You know, what, who, how was the surgery done? Was the surgery successful, right? Who's ever, you know, had a doctor walk out of the operating room and go, man, I blew that one, right? They're all successful surgeries, if, depending who you ask. Um, so it's a matter of, of figuring out a lot of different things. Uh, what do they do immediately afterwards? So obviously it's going to have an impact. Anytime you cut into your body, it's going to have an impact on your exercise performance. But uh, how that represents itself is going to be unique to each person. So that kind of leads into next week where we'll talk about the, the myths and truths and pull back the curtain on corrective exercise. And it's not what you, you, you think it is. And, and our answers may surprise you. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a, a couple quick shameless plugs that we're excited about. Not only are we going to be back on with Instagram Live, uh, or sometimes we'll switch it up and go Facebook Live every Friday at one o'clock if you want to kind of pencil that in your calendar with different topics. And if you have suggestions for the topic, shoot Mike or I a message and, and we're, we're happy to jump on. Or if you have questions we can run with, uh, we'll do that. Um, and we're excited that we've, we've nailed down a date for our first live course. We were supposed to do our first live course um, you know, a, a couple different times and COVID has kind of thrown that in a tailspin, but we have one that we're fingers crossed going to hopefully launch in just outside of Philadelphia in Cherry Hill, New Jersey on May 1st. Um, so we'll be getting you more details on that. And then I'll be heading up to, to Mike's place uh, to film our, our, our online course, which we're going to release at some point in, in March. So I'll be heading up there in a couple of weeks to have some cannolis and, and, and film the online version of this. Um, and we'll get that out to you at some point in March. So stay tuned. Make sure you follow us. We're going to be putting out posts every day uh, with tons of content, um, as well as letting you know when those two things are happening. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, uh, and like Eric said, rather, if you have any questions or any topics you want us to discuss, obviously, we're going to be you know, focusing a lot on programming, but we're going to end up going into you know, uh, different directions and, and covering various things. So if there's something you'd like us to talk about, uh, we will do our best to uh, give you as much uh, pertinent information as possible. Um, also, guys, if you want to check out the content that we're putting out on programming, uh, Principles of Program Design, uh, you can find us on Facebook and you can find us on Instagram as well. Uh, we are putting out content pretty much every day, whether it's videos, tips, infographics, et cetera. But again, if you guys need anything, you have any questions, please let us know. Appreciate you all tuning in and uh, enjoy the weekend. And we'll see you next week as we talk about why we hate corrective exercise. All right, guys, we'll see you. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks, brother. Go Pats. There you go. That's it.